So we're here to talk about um, uh, Baha'u'llah, can share some stories with you. Um, you know, this year we're uh, celebrating in 2017 the bicentenary, the 200th uh, year of the anniversary of the birth of Baha'u'llah. And in a letter from the Universal House of Justice, the uh, governing body of the Baha'is of the world, they say, the peoples of the earth have always been remembered by their God. I think is a really heartwarming thing to keep in our hearts. This year, people around the world are celebrating the 200th anniversary of the birth of Baha'u'llah, founder of the Baha'i faith and the divine educator for this age. Baha'u'llah envisioned a future where all humanity operates as one family. He taught that every human being has a unique purpose to help bring about a unified world that justice enables each of us to fulfill his potential. And that the inequalities between women and men, black and white, rich and poor, east and west, must dissolve. Allah's life and his impact on the world is one of the most dramatic humanity has ever seen. How many of you were at the event last night at the Palmer Center? Um, they showed a film there, and if you didn't see it there, you can see it online, uh, Light to the World. It's now released uh, online. And that really showed you in detail the impact that Baha'u'llah has had in these last 200 years on people in every country and every um, uh, race and ethnic diversity around the world. Um, so who is Baha'u'llah? You know, when I, was, uh, in, uh, when I first encountered the Baha'i faith and was investigating it, as a young adult, it was important to me to find out uh, more about the details of who Baha'u'llah actually was, what his life was, because lots of people say good things, you know, and then maybe you find out, well, but they, their life doesn't really reflect the teachings that, that they bring. But um, Baha'u'llah was really quite different in that way. He absolutely reflected what he taught. So who was Baha'u'llah? Baha'u'llah was born in 1817 in uh, Persia, in Tehran. His life spanned most of the 19th century. When he was born in 1817, Abraham Lincoln was a boy of eight living in Indiana. Frederick Douglass was born, <clears throat> was a baby born into slavery in Maryland. And James Monroe was president of the United States, which had only 19 states. Baha'u'llah was a descendant of the great Persian kings of old and two holy prophets, Zoroaster and Abraham. In Tehran, uh, Baha'u'llah was a nobleman who grew up in a family of privilege and position. His father was a vizier, a minister of state, and people expected that Baha'u'llah would follow in his father's footsteps because that was the custom of the time, but he did not. But this was one of the things that um, impressed me when I was investigating the life of Baha'u'llah. That is that he had at the outset everything that we normally aspire to. He had wealth and position and privilege. He had, um, in a material way, everything going for him. He had the respect of the people around him. Um, he was, uh, he was, he had everything that we kind of strive for, but in fact, uh, he gave this all up as he um, spread his mission. Because in 18, uh, let's see, when I would also say as a young man, he married and he had a family. And then in 1844, when Baha'u'llah was 27 years old, an extraordinary spiritual movement swept across the country. A young man who called himself the Bab, meaning the gate, declared that he was a messenger of God. But his mission was to prepare the way for an even greater divine messenger, the promised one of all religions. And this would be Baha'u'llah. In Tehran, Baha'u'llah became a leading disciple of the Bab. But opposition, a number of religious leaders and others in authority opposed the new faith. And this opposition built up to such a point that the Bab himself was executed after only six years of his mission. And events transpired that triggered a fierce bloodbath that was directed against all the Babis, with 
the aim of eliminating every trace of this new faith. A number of the God's leading disciples were killed, and it was at this time that Baha'u'llah himself was arrested, was beaten, and imprisoned. His family was forced to flee their home and go into hiding. Overnight, everything that they had had was taken away. After some months in prison, and Baha'u'llah, I would say, was unjustly imprisoned. He had done nothing to cause this himself. After some months in this prison, which was called the Sea of Shawl, the Black Pit, was a really terrible place. When life or death was uncertain, Baha'u'llah was not executed, but he and his family were exiled. They, they had to, um, again, Baha'u'llah, in his, in his earthly life, experienced what many people in the world have had to experience. You know, the, the loss of their home, the loss of their, their belongings. He was exiled from his homeland to which they would never return. Um, the first city that he was exiled to was um, Baghdad. It was the first of four cities to which he had been exiled. Now, in Baghdad, he wasn't imprisoned as such, even though he was a political prisoner. Uh, so he was able to go out and around the city. And um, people got to know him. And they got to um, to know about his um, to become acquainted with his spirit and his majesty, his majesty and his wisdom, his knowledge. So I want to read you just a short um, bit from encounters with Baha'u'llah that people had in Baghdad, because I think you know I can tell you a lot of facts about Baha'u'llah, but part of what the story of Baha'u'llah does is open up. What were those encounters like? You know, what would we have done if we had lived back in that time? How did people um, respond to Baha'u'llah, whether or not they knew that he was a manifestation of God? And at this time in Baghdad, no one knew because he hadn't announced yet that he was a manifestation of God. So they were simply responding to him. So I'm going to read to you a, a, an abbreviated excerpt um, from this time. The religious leaders of Baghdad had tested Baha'u'llah with their most difficult spiritual questions. It was not only the profound knowledge and wisdom of his answers, but the unmistakable majesty of his spirit that soon made them true admirers of Baha'u'llah. They praised him to others who set out to meet Baha'u'llah for themselves. Soon, visitors of all kinds came to Baha'u'llah's home from princes to peasants, from poets to mystics to government officials. There were Christians, Jews, Muslims, and Babis, Kurds, Persians, Arabs, and Turks. There were the curious, the seekers of truth, and those needing help, the poor, the sick, the aged, the victims of injustice. Baha'u'llah received them all. Baha'u'llah's house was modest, the room to which visitors came was not grand, but made of mud and straw. The roof was low, the garden small. The simple couch where Baha'u'llah sat made from the branches of palms. Yet to many, Baha'u'llah's presence made it a paradise. I know not how to explain it, said one prince to his friend, where all the sorrows of the world crowded into my heart. They would, I feel, all vanish, but in the presence of Baha'u'llah, Another prince decided to build in his own home an exact copy of the wonderful room. Baha'u'llah smiled when he heard this. He may well succeed in reproducing outwardly this room made of mud and straw, said Baha'u'llah. But what of his ability to open onto it the spiritual doors to the hidden worlds of God? Baha'u'llah did not usually agree to secret meetings, but he welcomed one sincere soul who asked to meet at midnight. They talked together until morning. When the visitor left Baha'u'llah, a friend eagerly asked about his encounter. I have been told that there was much wine in the room of Baha'u'llah, he replied, that these people had no moral principles whatsoever. I went to investigate for myself and found purity within purity. I was filled with amazement at the sanctity of that place and bewildered to find the exact opposite of that which I had heard. I am firmly convinced, he told his friend, that this is the truth. And you know, one of the principles that Baha'u'llah teaches is the independent investigation of truth. That 
we all need to investigate for ourselves, not to rely on what somebody else tells us. And he says we all in this age have that capacity. Now, Baha'u'llah, I said, was uh, exiled first to Baghdad. From there, he was exiled to three other cities, first to uh, Istanbul, to Ivernia, and then lastly to the prison city of Akka. Why was he exiled? Because in every place that he went, he attracted people. Even uh, when he was in Adrianople, for example, the, uh, the governor, the, the, the people of, um, of uh, the people, um, the leaders there, religious leaders and government officials and so forth, were attracted to Baha'u'llah. So the Sultan wasn't happy about this. Really, they wanted to extinguish this cause of Baha'u'llah. They wanted Baha'u'llah to be forgotten. And so they exiled him to the most remote place, this Akka, a prison city of Akka. And anybody sent there, this is where the worst criminals were sent, was expected to just perish and be forgotten. So we, we've talked about encounters of people who uh, were attracted to Baha'u'llah. This, uh, is from the opening chapter of the story of Baha'u'llah, is an uh, encounter with somebody who was actually bent on killing Baha'u'llah. And we'll see how that went. This is Sheikh Mahmoud's secret plan. Sheikh Mahmoud walked north along the streets of Akka with a determined stride. A gentle sea breeze off the Mediterranean ruffled his white beard and his long black abba, but the Sheikh was too angry to notice. The Persian government and the Ottoman Empire might be afraid to execute an enemy of Islam, but he, Sheikh Mahmoud, was not. As the brick prison barracks came into view, Sheikh Mahmoud clutched the cold metal dagger more tightly beneath his cloak. The task was simple and would surely please God. He would eliminate the heretic who dared to claim he was God's chosen messenger. Tell the prisoner I wish to see him, Sheikh Mahmoud told the guards at the prison gate. Although the prisoner was not allowed visitors, the guards obeyed, for the Sheikh was a highly respected Muslim teacher and leader in Akka. The guards delivered the Sheikh's message, but the prisoner answered calmly, tell him to cast away the weapon, and then he may come in. Sheikh Mahmoud was startled when he heard the reply. How could the prisoner know about the dagger? It was still well hidden, and he had told no one of his plan. Puzzled and upset, the Sheikh returned home. But Sheikh Mahmoud was not a man to be thwarted when he set his mind to do something, and he was physically strong. He did not need a weapon. His own two hands were strong enough to accomplish the task. The determined Sheikh Mahmoud returned once again to prison. Once again, he asked to see the prisoner. This time, the reply came, tell him to purify his heart first, and then he may come in. The Sheikh was astonished to hear this answer. <laughs> what magic did the prisoner possess that he could read the inner secrets of his heart? Once again, he left the prison, more deeply disturbed this time, his mission still unaccomplished. Later, the troubled Sheikh fell into a deep sleep. He dreamed about his father, who was long dead, and about a wise old Sheikh who had visited his father when Mahmoud was a boy of 10. The Sheikh told Mahmoud to watch for the coming of the Lord, the promised one sent by God. He would come to Akka, the Sheikh had said, for little Mahmoud was a grown man. He would speak Persian and dwell in an upper room at the top of a long flight of stairs. When Sheikh Mahmoud awoke, his dream lingered with him, vivid and clear. As he pondered the words of the wise old Sheikh, questions deep within him and long forgotten began to stir. Sheikh Mahmoud decided to return once more to the prison gate. Again, he took no weapon, but this time, the malice of his heart had given way to a new desire, a deep longing to discover the truth. This time, when Sheikh Mahmoud asked to see the prisoner, the prisoner gave his consent. The Sheikh walked up a long flight of stone stairs that led to the prison cells. He spoke first with the prisoner's eldest son, who prepared him to meet with his father. Finally, Sheikh Mahmoud stood at the threshold of the prisoner's cell and was given permission to enter. The man who stood before him was of middle age and average height, with jet black hair and beard. <clears throat> As a prisoner, he had survived the black pit of Tehran and the mountainous winter journey into exile. 
He had endured the torture of the bastinado, the soles of his feet beaten until they bled, and the weight of a hundred pound chain that left its scars upon his neck. He had faced down assassins and their guns in Baghdad, but his hand was no longer steady and his writing wavered now in the poison that had been meant to end his life. Sheikh Mahmoud did not know about all these things, but one thing he realized at once, his prisoner was not at all what he had imagined him to be. When he moved, it was with a natural grace and majesty that made Sheikh Mahmoud feel like a humble subject in the presence of his king. When he spoke, he spoke with the assurance of a king and more, with a love that penetrated every word. This was the one called Baha'u'llah, the glory of God. The gentle sound of waves lapping against the city wall drifted in through the prison window. Akka was a prison city on the shores of the Holy Land, and Baha'u'llah had been sent there in 1868 to die. Baha'u'llah, who was the noble son of a noble family, who was called father by the poor for his loving kindness and generosity, whose wisdom and courage were recognized even by his enemies. Baha'u'llah had been sent to Akka to die. Yet when offered a chance to escape his fate, he had refused to run away. Who is to be preferred, Baha'u'llah later wrote, he that hath sheltered himself behind curtains, or he that hath offered himself in the path of God? Although Baha'u'llah had committed no crime, in the eyes of his accusers he had committed the greatest crime. He claimed to be a divine messenger, chosen by God to speak to the world as the great prophets before him had done. Abraham, Moses, Krishna, Buddha, Zoroaster, Christ, and Muhammad. He claimed to fulfill the prophecies of old and to bring new guidance from God. The sting is not from me, Baha'u'llah had written to the Shah of Persia, but from one who is almighty and all-knowing. His accusers were outraged. Blasphemy, they called it. How dare he, who had never even received religious training, claim to speak with divine authority. And if my sin be this, Baha'u'llah further wrote, that I have exalted the word of God and revealed his cause, then indeed am I the greatest of sinners. Such a sin I will not barter for the kingdoms of earth and heaven. When Baha'u'llah spoke, people were drawn to listen. With the eloquence of his arguments, he stirred their thoughts and inspired their hearts as no one else. Many were convinced that he spoke the truth. Baha'u'llah's enemies could not bear it. They wanted his name, his life, and his cause erased from the face of the earth. In 1868, they used their sovereign powers to exile Baha'u'llah to Akka in Palestine, far from his Persian homeland. There he would surely die, they thought, disgraced and entirely forgotten. But the Quran warns they plotted what God plotted, and a plotter's is God the best. The rulers who imprisoned Baha'u'llah thought of themselves as mighty kings who commanded the peoples of the world. They forgot that the sovereignty of kings is not the sovereignty of God, who claims for his domain the hearts of all humankind. Blinded by their ambitions, they could not know that one day, when their own names lay forgotten as dust, the name of Baha'u'llah would be cherished in every land. From his first moment in Baha'u'llah's presence, Sheikh Mahmoud felt the power and majesty of the messenger of God. The Sheikh could scarcely look upon Baha'u'llah's face, so radiant did it shine with his spirit. Here was a splendor that needed no royal robes or trumpets to herald. Here was a majesty that belonged to no one else on earth. The Sheikh's own position as a respected religious leader paled all at once to insignificance. Moved by a deep sense of reverence and a joy that flooded his being, Sheikh Mahmoud lay face down, prostrate at the feet of Baha'u'llah. How else could he express the feelings that overwhelmed him, the awe and wonder and gratitude? How could he explain the certain knowledge that filled his heart? He was but a candle in the presence of the sun. The Lord had indeed come to Akka. 
So that is the end of the story that I wanted to share with you. But I um, wanted to stay here for a few moments to, um, to see if you have any questions that you would like to ask about the whole lot. Uh, or, or any comments that you would like to share. You can read some of this, you know, if you go online at lahai.org, also, well, you can read the book because there's a lot of detail in that. That's really good. But just to get an overview, you can go online at lahai.org and they have about the Bobby movement, about the Bob, about the whole lot, very nicely, succinctly put together so that you can get a nice overview. And then you can read my book to get all the juicy details. Yes. I'm just curious, uh, how many sons Baha'u'llah had and why Abdul Baha was the chosen one to carry on? I know he has several sons, but I was just curious why. You know, Baha'u'llah was the good one, I'm trying to say. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Abdul Baha. <laughs> you know, that, that's um, part of what I did was to include. Baha, Abu Baha and what he did in this book to um, um, so that by the end of the book when Baha'u'llah appoints him the center of his covenant the reader can say oh yes of course it would be Abu Baha because Abu Baha just really was um, and of course his younger brother also really reflected the attributes of, of Baha'u'llah um, but his younger brother died uh, you know, as you know and um, um, and you know, and so Abu Baha really imbibed and and embodied the teachings of his father. And there there are many things in the writings about Abu Baha actually being a, you know a special spirit. I, I can't even explain that at this point. But you could see by his actions, because you know we all. I mean, one of the reasons for writing this book about Baha'u'llah and including Abu Baha, the Holy Family, and various other and you know, the people who weren't so nice too, that you can see by their actions, they reflect um, their attributes or lack of them. And we see with, with Abu Baha, for example, he was always oriented towards service. You know, he embodied the teachings that his father talked about. Abu Baha, you know, served the Babis, but even when he was a prisoner in Akka, he was helping the poor and, and in various ways. And he became known there as father of the poor, as his father had been known in Tehran. So um, this was just a reflection on uh, the movie I watched last night. Um, so beautiful to see the accounts worldwide, the, with the personal accounts of this worldwide community that came out, you know, out of this prisoner, this exile. <laughs> um, yes, and yes. So we have, and that's really the exciting thing. And I, and next week. This is part one. Next week, we're going to look at more of Baha'u'llah's teachings and the impact it had on my community at that time. But as we were seeing in the in this film, and um, which is also available online on the, that um, the impact that it's had in every country of the world with every kind of people, you know, and and that was really one of the most, you know, I have to. I was saying to someone afterwards. I said we we have a tendency in America. You look at the news, and I don't care if you're looking at it online or on your television or whatever, we see a lot of um, American folks, you know, doing what we're doing, whatever that is. But what was really uh, interesting last night in the film was hearing from, in their own language with subtitles, people from every portion of the world, and people that look really different from me, and some who look the same, and to recognize that there are people out in villages as well as big cities who have gotten hold of these concepts of Baha'u'llah which are very much cutting edge concepts about related to the oneness of humanity not just like oh yeah, let's all live together nicely but really the um, the uh, tools with which we do that the, the specific teachings and how do we go about consulting they talked about consultation which we'd love to have some of our political folks be that <laughs> Um, so yes, that that's really exciting. So, and so if you haven't watched that, that movie, I encourage you to, to find it online. Yes, sir. Talking about these tools you just mentioned, aren't the Baha'is the only ones building a worldwide parallel government, actually implementing 
Yes. Well, yes, we're working on this, uh, and don't anybody get scared. You know, we're not we're not making laws that are going to affect you. But <laughs> from the grassroots, we're, from we're the grassroots. We're working with well because we don't have clergy. We're working with uh, we elect local spiritual assemblies and create communities in which we're trying to put these into practice. We have national spiritual assemblies, and um, there is God's greater plan that applies to the world at large, and we see that that the old world order is is meeting all of its goals, which is that these outmoded institutions and outmoded laws and things are, which are no longer functioning, are being challenged and falling apart. And what the Baha'is have to focus our attention on is building up something new. And the something new is not just about, you know, we think in terms of, uh, in terms of governance and just laying out laws and such like that. What Baha'is are, uh, are being encouraged to focus on is the process you know, we are learning, for example, we just uh, we're very focused on consultation and how to talk together to arrive at a decision, to put something into action, to come back and reflect on that and say, okay, what did we learn from that? And this is a way of moving forward. And, you know, so we think, again, let me bring up that we think that we're doing that in somehow in the United States or other big Western nations that we're doing great stuff. But you know, it was in, uh, they showed just a small piece of it last night in the island of Vanuatu, out in the Pacific, where uh, the friends had been, the Baha'i friends had been involved in the institute process and learning this process of how to consult together and do things. They had a hurricane hit their community, the whole island, because you know, there's no place to go. And you know, it was the junior youth helped the old people, the young people get to shelter after the, because these were the, the the uh, people who have been involved in this Baha'i process after the hurricane, the Baha'i community was very involved in um, looking at what was first needed and started setting up things to help the children in school and to uh, um, have the, uh, they um, got the, the, the coffee farms were decimated and so they got all these little seedlings for coffee plantings they were giving out to uh, uh, farmers, but every day, Every day, this community would consult together, go out and do work, come back and reflect on what, what had gone well and what needed to change or whatever. Yet they, they, were, they became a model of the people who uh, of being resilient in the face of, of uh, difficulty and ordeal. Now, they did it so effectively that the Baha'i International Community you know, used them as a model and wrote up a statement to present to the United Nations as to the kinds of things that a community can do, can put into place, the kinds of processes, and um, so that they can respond to anything that comes up in this resilient way. It was quite a contrast to uh, uh, when um, things that, other, that had happened in other uh, small nations where they had had uh, hurricanes or or uh, earthquakes or whatever, and uh, dependent on outside help, you know, which did not go nearly as well. So yeah, it's so the business about government at this point is we're in a very early, early stage, but we're following, you know, the, the precepts of Baha'u'llah and under the guidance of the Universal House of Justice at this point, and really taking small, small steps, but they're really important steps because it's laying important foundational groundwork so that people feel empowered in their own neighborhoods. You know, we are, we are, as America, we're, we, we say that we're quite built on democracy and, you know, everybody having a voice, but um, that could get lost in, in the political this is and that's. And so this, the process of the Baha'is are involved with this alternate government that you're talking about, it's really this kind of helping people take small steps to know that they have a voice and to uh, recover that in positive ways where they're at. Okay, that's not a story, that's a lot of story. <laughs> yes. Uh, also in the, um, the story of life of Baha'u'llah, is in the two government of Iran and Ottoman Empire, they exiled Baha'u'llah and the family step by step to Accra. They meant that it's the worst place in the earth, but meanwhile, fulfillment of the promise of the 
all the manifestations that the promised one is going to be in the Holy Land. He's going to be there. He's going to, so this is the place that the whole other religion, the world, waiting to, to, to see him in that Holy Land. So yes. they didn't know that they are doing their job to send Baha'u'llah <laughs> to the, the promised one to the Holy Land. To the yes, it wasn't, it wasn't that Baha'u'llah said, oh, I think I will just he go to the Holy Land and fulfill yeah. those prophecies. No, it, it happened in that way. Yes, and those are great <coughs> symbols. He did fulfill, he did fulfill those prophecies. That's right. Yes. Uh, I attended the wonderful meeting that you all had last night in Austin, and it was great. And uh, prior to the meeting start, they were showing the slideshow of the recognition that the Baha'i communities all over the world they are getting from uh, for doing peaceful um, kind of the activities that they do. Uh, including I, at the end, I saw, and also this morning, I saw that uh, in Austin, you all got the for permission from the mayor of Austin. That's right. Um, I wish you would just shortly elaborate and speak of those to the. You know, he, he read those, and I followed them on a line, but then some of the people maybe went. Well, do you, do you, you can, if you go to that Baha'i.org site, they have, uh, you can have a place where you can see all of those. I, can you remember some of them that, that you saw? I know yes, that it's from, from India, from, from Australia, for example, from China, from the um, United yeah. Nations, from presidents of here and there, from the, India, even from Iran, or some Ayatollah from Iran sent, which is Muslim country. They yes. send and they congratulate Baha'i community for this occasion, and they admire the peaceful um, action activities that they are doing all over the world. Those so yeah, they were different. If go to that page, there is a Baha'i right. Even a, oh, we have. Well, here we are. So uh, I know they had, uh, when I looked online, they had different levels of, they had international levels, they had uh, gubernatorial uh, tributes, you know, in the U.S., and um, um, mayoral tributes. So here's from the Prime Minister of uh, New Delhi from India, the government of Pakistan, from Malaysia, from Singapore, from... Bangladesh. You know, we had one from uh, Jimmy Carter. Yes. Um, from uh, the Prime Minister of, of Britain, Great Britain. Um, so we have, yes. The Mayor of Austin. The Mayor of Austin. Yes. Definitely. We, many of those had that up on our Facebook. You know, so, yeah, there, there were very many. Uh, as, and as you say, it's um, the Baha'is may go to them, but they are often aware of Baha'i activities in their area. I was listening to uh, somebody had posted on Facebook the uh, mayor of Tucson who was giving a, uh, uh, reading his proclamation. And, you know, it's because, it's because the Baha'is are doing things in a peaceful way and, they, and the Baha'is have peaceful goals and often collaborate and work with other organizations in the community, you know, as we do here in Austin. So, yeah, it's, it's a big thing that other people have in the, these positions of responsibility um, are happy to collaborate with the Baha'is and to, um, uh, you know, to tribute, to give us tributes for this, our own special occasions here. I think that in itself is a testimony, you know, Baha'u'llah from the prison wrote to the kings and rulers of his time, you know, mm -hmm. and today many of those, you know, mayors and government and presidents and whatnot now I can do tribute to that. Yes, yes. And talking about that, actually, you know, I wanted to read something. Also in this book, I do write a little bit of what Mahala highlighted of, uh, he wrote to various different rulers. One of them he wrote to Queen Victoria. And um, in that letter, in his tablet to Queen Victoria, he also addressed the parliaments of the world. So that means any of congresses and parliaments that meet as a body. He said, O oh, ye, the elected representatives of people in every land, take ye counsel together, and let your concern be only for that which profiteth mankind, and bettereth the conditions thereof. Regard the world as the human body, which though its creation, at creation, whole and perfect, perfect, 
have been afflicted through various causes with grave disorders and maladies. Not for one day did it gain ease, nay, its sickness waxed more severe as it fell under the treatment of ignorant physicians who gave full rein to their personal desires and had erred grievously. And if at one time through the care of an able physician a member of that body was healed, the rest remained afflicted as before. So he was saying that the world languished in the hands of inept rulers. We behold it in this day, O Baha'u'llah, at the mercy of rulers so drunk with pride that they cannot discern clearly their own best advantage, much less recognize a revelation as bewildering and challenging as this. And whenever any one of them has striven to improve its condition, his motive has been his own gain, whether confessedly so or not, and the unworthiness of this motive have limited his power to heal or cure. So he was saying, he goes on to say that the, that which the Lord has ordained is the sovereign remedy and mightiest instrument for the healing of all the world, is the union of all its peoples in one universal cause, one common faith. This can in no wise be achieved except through the power of the skilled and all-powerful and inspired physician who is the messenger of God for this day, Baha'u'llah. So, you know, we need to work with these precepts. We need to work with the, the uh, teachings of Baha'u'llah, with that spirit that, um, you know, that those teachers in, uh, imbue in us to achieve the things we want. We can't do it just by ourselves. You know, we've been very big about the one, the, the principle of the oneness of humanity, but Baha'u'llah says in his writings that we do not achieve that oneness without justice, you know. And many of the things that we're seeing that are just hard for you to watch on our news in one way or another are bringing to the surface issues of justice that must be addressed. And people are feeling more empowered now to, to bring these to the surface and to address them. So it's, and again, you know, there's a, what's going on in the larger world and it's influenced by the, the uh, spirit released by Baha'u'llah you know, in, in his teachings. So yes, none of this is easy. You know, one of his, one of his teachings to the, uh, the nations of the world is they need to come together and, uh, and one of the things they need to do is agree on their boundaries. Well, hello, that's not an easy thing to do. That's going to require, I mean, we need to learn consultation. So A, we know how to talk with each other to even get to step, you know, step one. So lots of things that need doing. And I think, you know, one of the takeaways from, for example, watching the, the movie is that, is to, <clears throat> to know that despite what we tend to see in our media in one way or another, in whatever form we take it in, which tends to really focus on a lot of the things that feel negative and the, the downside of, of you know, all the broken bits that are going on, and that's real, that's true. But the fact that there is this other really positive thing that is also a reality. You know, we were having this discussion in our online class. We did a Institute. We have an online class for the story of Baha'u'llah. And uh, somebody was asking a similar question. Well, you know, it said spiritually such and such thing happened, but in the real world, these events seem to move to that. Now, how could those things both be true? We were talking about, you know, those pictures that you've seen that uh, depending upon how you look at it, you see one thing or another, you see a vase or you see two faces. I mean, you know, you've seen those kind of, kind of tricky photos. It's like that with our perception. You know, the things that are going on in the world, yes, they're real, but from Baha'u'llah's perception, when we understand, you know, when we delve into the words of Baha'u'llah and his teachings and that perspective on the time that we're, what this time in the world is, what we're going through, we have a different perspective on what it means, what meaning to assign to it. It's not, you know, all this dystopian stuff that we see popping up on TV series that we're all falling apart and, oh, you know, where do we go from here? It's really, there are real positive things happening, but part of, in order to develop these positive things, these other old outmoded things, you know, are falling by the wayside. Unfortunately, many people suffer because of that. And, you know, part of our, our um, calling is to do what we can do to ease the suffering and, and the whole of the universal house of justice tells us that part of that is moving forward with these processes, you know, so that people feel more empowered in their families and in their neighborhoods and such, 
so that they are not um, uh, taken in by these other things that are, are so terrible to them. So I think we need to wrap it up here. It's noon. And uh, thank you for all your questions and comments. I wonder if you could stay for a while to sign your books if anyone wishes to purchase Sure. Them. Yes. And, and don't forget part two next week. Yeah. <laughs>